this way. Um, and so uh, since that time, uh, Lenny's been, uh, 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 he was at, uh, he's in applied mathematics uh, and laboratory for computer science at MIT. Uh, and in 1987, he joined uh, Virginia Tech, uh, August uh, institution to the north. Um, so, and he's worked on a lot of things, um, but most recently, he's been uh, very interested in computational genomics. So, yeah. we're very okay. interested here. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I want to tell you about four problems that I've worked on in the past. And to do so, whoops. Okay, can you kill it? <laughs> Get up there. Go away. Go away. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, remind you of a little bit of biology and then talk about the four problems. So the biology is starts with genomes. So organisms have genomes, the DNA that that uh, makes up their genomes. And each letter in, the, in a genome is called a nucleotide. And so this is part of the human genome. Uh, it just looks like a string of A, C, G's, and T's. So it's great for computer scientists. Um, if you look at the central dogma, it tells you to look at three kinds of molecules in the cell. One is the DNA, which carries the genes. The genes can be transcribed, or copied basically, into messenger RNA, and then messenger RNA is translated into protein, which does various jobs in the, in the cell. Now the first topic I want to talk about is alternative splicing. Uh, what is splicing? So in higher organisms, the gene has uh, a certain structure, it has exons and introns. And the exons are the portions of the open reading frame that are retained, and the introns are the parts that are spliced out. Now, uh, it turns out that this picture is not definite. That is, there are alternative ways of splicing the same open reading frame and you can get different products. So here's a, an example of a, an open reading frame with three exons and two introns. You can have one way of, of splicing it might give you exons one, two, and three, and therefore one protein product. And another way of splicing it might leave out exon two and ultimately give you a different protein product. So what we're interested in is how is this controlled? And we are looking at uh, what are called splicing regulatory elements. These are really short sequences inside either the exons or the introns that are used to control whether the splicing occurs or not and under what circumstances. So here's a couple of examples of some uh, uh, exons where there are highlighted some uh, splicing regulatory elements that we uh, identified in our work. Uh, what happens with splicing regulatory elements is that they're bound by proteins that are called splicing factors. These uh, lead to the, either the splicing or the lack of splicing. Uh, we use data from uh, Key et al., a mini-gene approach where they looked at all the uh, six length long nucleotide sequences, measured and put them in mini-genes. So they did 4,096 experiments and they measured the level of inclusion of exons in the messenger RNA. Uh, then they were able to rank these uh, by inclusion, and these, those that are highly ranked are good candidates for being enhancing elements. 
So we especially looked at enhancing elements in the exons. So we use a De Bruijn graph representation for uh, sequences. It's uh, a way of capturing how a little window of six wide nucleotides would, uh, would move through uh, a nucleotide sequence. Uh, the nodes of the graph are all the six linked sequences. So you see the one at the center. The ones to the left are the ones that could have come before it, and the ones to the right are the ones that could have come after it. And so we have edges that connect those together. So we get this graph with 4,096 nodes. Uh, from the previous uh, work with the mini-gene approach, we get the uh, enhancer candidates and use them to build a subgraph of this larger graph and then we have an algorithm that will identify potential uh, splicing regulatory elements. And so we identified a number of them just from that algorithm. We used some subsequent, uh, they had a variety of links. So that was one of the things that we were particularly interested in is that splicing regulatory elements could be of different links. Uh, we did some uh, enrichment analysis to determine that we could reduce that number to about 2,000. And then we looked in experimental databases and were able to uh, verify that our sequences, at least some of our sequences, were in databases that had been experimentally verified. That was the first one. Genome alignment is the second project I wanted to mention. So uh, let's think about evolution. Evolution acts on genomes. So we think of an ancestral genome, some changes occur, mutations, and we come up with a current genome. So what kinds of mutations are we particularly uh, likely to see? We see single nucleotide changes. Those are uh, fairly common. Uh, we see insertions and deletions, places where little pieces of the sequence have been removed or little pieces of sequence have been added. We see varying repeats. So here we have uh, either four copies of CTT or five copies of CTT, giving you different numbers of uh, repeats. Uh, at a bigger scale uh, in a genome, you can have a gain of uh, genes or loss of genes. Uh, and at the kind of the biggest level, you can have major rearrangements of the genome, where one part of it is moved to another part or it's reversed. Various things happen at a very large scale. Those large scale arrangements are kind of hard to get a handle on. So uh, we were interested in comparing genomes, two genomes, to see how similar they were. Uh, the traditional way of doing that is sequence alignment. Uh, you, you can come up with a, a matching up of characters to the best you can and then have spaces where you have insertions and deletions. You can also look at the gene content of two genomes and say, well, how much, uh, which genes are in this genome, which genes are in this genome, how closely do they match? Uh, another one that we have looked at is average nucleotide identity, just a measure of if you look at blocks in one genome, how similar are they to blocks in the other genome? In all cases, you have rearrangements being a very challenging uh, situation. So what we did is we came up with a graph representation for alignments. Uh, so we have two genomic sequences here in this example. Each node is a nucleotide. The blue 
uh, edges give the order of the nucleotides in each genome. The black edges give the matches where two uh, nucleotides share a common descent. That doesn't mean they're identical. That just means they uh, descended from the same ancestral nucleotide. Uh, and there's actually two directions. There's a forward and reverse direction in genomes. And so we have a red, uh, the red edges represent reversals. So what we were able to do with this is uh, analyze it for something we call breakable arrangements. This is a way of recursively decomposing uh, an alignment by breaking it into blocks. So it is, could be uh, a fairly deep hierarchy, but it would still be a way of recursively decomposing. If we could do that, we uh, showed that there was a dynamic programming algorithm that would optimally uh, align uh, two genomes. Uh, furthermore, we showed that uh, many real-world examples of alignments of, of genomes are breakable. So that was the second one. The, sec the third one uh, has to do with uh, organizing life on this planet. So if you think about the Linnaean taxonomy, you know how uh, there is a hierarchy of, of organization for life. In particular, you know about genus and species. Um, there is a disadvantage in our modern age for using the traditional approach to genus and species naming, and that is it takes a long time. You have to identify the species, you have to spell out what it is, and then you have to get it published. Um, so that's a disadvantage of that scheme that we wanted to address, but furthermore, we wanted to address variation among genomes at a level below species, at the level of individuals, in fact. So we know that uh, sequencing genomes is becoming cheaper and cheaper and faster and faster. And we can use this to get genomes of bacteria, of viruses, of plants, of animals. And when we have those genomes, we can compare them. In this case, we're using average nucleotide identity for comparison. Um, and using that comparison base, we can determine which genomes are close to other genomes. Okay? It sounds a little like phylogeny, but it's not really phylogeny. It's just a way of doing, uh, of finding what's close to, to other, what genomes are close to other genomes. Uh, we, this results in a hierarchy of uh, genomes that we organize using a, a code called a LIN code, or life identification number. Uh, it's based on uh, percentage identity. If you have two genomes, you can give, it a give them each a code. So the first example, there are two genomes with codes that are the same up to the last position. The last position corresponds to 99% identity. So if we found that those two genomes were 99% identical, then we would assign them codes identical up to the last position. And similarly for the other example, they're, they're identical up to the fourth position, which means 80% similarity. Now the thing about uh, this kind of naming scheme is that it's fast. That is, you can do it as soon as you've gotten the genome. You don't have to wait for publication. You can have a service to do it. Um, the other thing is it's, the codes are not just arbitrary codes. They have meaning with respect to other genomes. 
So we've actually prototyped this. Uh, we've used it to compare to phylogenet known phylogenetic uh, relationships for a number of classes of organisms. Uh, this is a short list of, of the ones we've uh, developed uh, LIN codes for. And we found that there was a good match between what was accepted phylogeny and what you could gather from these codes. We've also uh, got, uh, uh, Boris Finatzer and I have a, a startup company where we're uh, want to provide a web service to provide this uh, naming for biologists, especially for uh, bacteria and viruses, things that have small genomes and we could quickly give them codes. Okay, the, the last project is viral genomics, which is something I've gotten into recently and, and very interested in because viral genomes are small genomes. Uh, they can be either DNA or RNA based. Uh, they have to use host cells to replicate. Uh, in particular, RNA viruses uh, are known to be particularly susceptible to mutations. So they replicate and they have a mutation. They replicate, they have a mutation. And um, as a very rough estimate, uh, there are approximately one nucleotide mutation per genome per re replication. So that's a lot of, of, um, lot of mutation. So if you look in a particular host cell, there are lots of viral particles. They're all a little bit, well, not all a little bit different, but many of them are different because of this uh, high level of mutation. Um, so the basis for evolution in a virus is this kind of viral family of variations, which is called a quasi-species. Now, if you're looking at individual virus particles, some of them are more fit than others. Some will be more readily survive, more readily replicate. So it's not that the variation isn't under some kind of control. Uh, in particular, most variations will die out so that you will find that the variations cluster in a particular part of uh, genome space, if you will. And a way to model genome space is as a hypercube. So many of us are familiar with binary hypercubes from parallel computing and other places. Um, if you change that so that the nodes are genome sequences, and the edges are again between nodes where there's one difference between the genomes, then you get a, a, a large, obviously, uh, hypercube. So what we're uh, trying to do right now is view evolution on this hypercube, moderated by the fact that there will be uh, a barrier of fitness uh, as to how, uh, how it can evolve. So what we would like to come up with is uh, a variety of things. Uh, we'd like to use LIN codes for rapid identification of viral genomes. For example, the Ebola genome. There are a number of Ebola genomes that have been sequenced. Uh, we've applied LIN code technology to that. Uh, We'd like to characterize the fitness landscape, that is what, is, what does fitness look like in a region of the hypercube? And we'd also like to characterize the transmission paths of the virus as it goes either within one host or from host to host. So at this time, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators. Uh, and uh, most of them are students. Uh, also, I have support from the National Science Foundation. Uh, and that's all I had to say.
questions for me. Okay. We have some. <laughs> so, in your in your line comparison technique of comparing two genomes, it assumes that you've done the de novo assembly, which actually correct. In order to do that de novo assembly, normally you get context, but you have to scaffold them together, which is usually biased by the fact that you have to find another genome to line up with. Right. Does that introduce biases. The probably. Are probably. Rearrangements. Oh yeah. Does. All right, so the question is about uh, using de novo assembly to uh, come up with these genomic sequences. Does that introduce bias because you don't, because of the, uh, perhaps the reference genome that you use to do, do the scaffolding? Uh, that is certainly possible. We don't address that issue. Um, the, the genomes we've used have been the genomes that have been uh, thoroughly sequenced and given to us uh, by other researchers or from common databases. Have you done bacterial, mitochondrial, viral, have you done any larger? What's the largest genome you've done? Uh, we haven't done it with larger genomes. It, it's, it's still a, a challenge to do the comparison for larger genomes. Yes. I have a, a question about um, the, uh, the work on uh, viral mutation you were presenting. Um, do you find uh, that uh, the viral genome uh, has uh, equal, equal potential for mutation uh, throughout the entire length, or is it concentrated? In it is, it is, well, here, here's the thing. Um, when you're when you're doing uh, sequencing of viral genomes, you're doing the viral genomes that actually survived. And so, the ones that actually survived, they definitely have a have certain places that are hot spots for mutation, and other places that don't mutate. So. I don't think anyone knows whether at the, at the cell level if they're really mutating everywhere and then just a lot of them dying off. They're very unfit. That there, there are a lot of them that are unfit. We, uh, I don't think we really know. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you again. Okay, thanks. Wait a, a few minutes uh, before we start for final talk. All right. You want to